how can we be shaped by God for the calling that he has for us in our lives? And so last week we talked about our spiritual gifts. That's what the S stands for. And today we're going to be talking about our heart and how God shapes us through shaping our heart. So I need you to do me a favor. I need you all to raise your right hand, place it over your heart. I'm not going to make you promise anything or pledge anything. I want you to listen and feel the beat of your heart. We each have a different rhythm and a different beat to our hearts. Uh, there's one thing that we all know, that if you have your hand there and you do feel it beating, you are alive. Congratulations. <laughs> and you're here and you're alive. If you don't, uh, raise your hand and we will help you uh, get down the street to the hospital. God has this, uh, and he put this inside of us, and this provides us life. It pumps blood to everywhere that needs blood to function. Uh, a lot of people think that if your brain goes, your body goes, no, your heart is what keeps you alive, that blood pumping. And so, how does God, and why does God want your heart, and what does it even mean? Does he want our physical heart? Probably you can answer that question yourselves. But, he wants what this heart resembles, and it's your life, and it's what makes you function. It's what makes you live. And it's what makes you run to a beat of your life. And so, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be jumping around. And the first thing I want us to think about and to talk about is God wants us first to commit our whole heart to Him. He wants us to commit our heart to follow Him. And we're going to read this in the Old Testament, and then Jesus is going to tell us the same thing. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4-6, through 6, it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and, he must, and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. And he goes on and talks about it. There's something about committing your heart to something. If you're in love, have you ever been in love? Oh, you just have my heart. You do sappy stuff, you write it on the card, maybe. Um, there's something about giving your all to something. I know firsthand what it's like when a heart does not function well and the effects of what it does to somebody. And so, uh, not just the good or, or the bad with that, but uh, our daughter had, was born with a couple of holes in her heart. And you could see in her life that she wanted to do things that couldn't do it. She couldn't eat a bottle because there was just something about it and it would make her go into heart failure. When she would drink it, it would go into her lungs, all these things. She couldn't stay awake long enough to do things. She just wanted to sleep because she, her heart was working extra to get blood where it needed to go because it wasn't functioning right. The amount of, of energy that she had to put into things was insane for what it looked like she was able to do. Now, after procedures were done and that was fixed up and everything was put back together the way it was supposed to, it was like a completely different girl. The energy level, her appetite, what she was able to do was like, wow, you fixed one little thing where your heart functions exactly the way it's supposed to function, how much more can we do? How much more can you put into things instead of just spinning your wheels, trying so hard, but you can't accomplish what you want? I think it's the same way in us following God. If we aren't committed fully and our heart isn't fully given to Him, we may think that we're serving Him, but we are just spending a lot of energy doing these things, but we're not accomplishing exactly what He wants us to. So the first thing that we want to do is, are we giving our whole hearts to God, are we committing all of them to Him? In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 12, verses 24 through 25, we get this scripture about the same idea about committing fully to God. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all of your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. And he goes on and is talking about uh, Saul and, and becoming a king. But the first thing he says is commit all of your heart to serving the Lord faithfully. How many of us have busy lives? How many of us, our lives aren't as busy as we think they are, but we still say they are just way too busy. <laughs> our priorities are out of whack these days because we feel like in order for us to be productive or for us to have good lives, we have to always be doing something. Now, always doing something takes away from doing important things as well. And I wonder if we've ever thought about what am I committed to? Showing up on a, on a Sunday and being a part of this family on, on a one day a week, 
we are committed to being here one day a week, but are we committed fully to each other and to what God has planned for us in our lives? Are we committed to reading his word? Are we committed to spending quality alone time in prayer with him? Are we committed to building up godly relationships? Are we committed to showing what God looks like to our children in our lives, in our prayer time, in our study of the Bible with them? Are we committed wholehearted to God? Now, this is not a guilt trip because guess what? Probably all of us can say we need to work more on these things, which leads us to a couple of things that we're going to be talking about. The next one is in the middle for a reason. I think this is the most important part of God shaping your heart because it's the most difficult, and that's having a repentant heart. Just because you mess up doesn't mean that you're not trying your best to fully commit your life to God. And it doesn't mean that you should give up either because you're not perfect and you're not good enough and you can't do things right. It also doesn't mean that you should pretend that you're not doing bad things either because God will just forgive you. Having a repentant heart is a skill set that you have to build and learn. And it's something that doesn't happen just by you saying, God, just forgive me for all these things. Because in a relationship, if you've ever been married, anybody, you're going to screw up. And you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to talk to your spouse and say, I'm sorry, I screwed up, or I didn't mean to treat you that way, or whatever it might be, and you have to have a conversation that is uncomfortable because you love that person. And you want your relationship to work. You want forgiveness to happen. And so you pour yourself out and say, let's talk about it. And you know what? It doesn't just fix it right away. You have to keep kind of working on those things that you made a mistake with. And you pour your heart out. God wants you to pour your heart out to him, too. And no one is better in the Bible of pouring their heart out to God than David is. Uh, David is a man that you can tell exactly how he's feeling by what you read. And David lets you know where his heart is at. And so in Psalm chapter 51 and 10 through 12, you know this because you sing this. You know this. It's a song that we sing. And you know why it's a song we sing? Because David probably had to sing this a lot for himself to be reminded of this mistake he made with Bathsheba and, and as a mistake that carried over into many other mistakes that carried over into sweeping something under the rug to pretend that his infidelities and, and adulterous behavior and murderous behaviors and lying were all for the good of taking care of now Bathsheba. And it's kind of silly, but we do the same thing. We make mistakes, and we cover them up, and make more mistakes trying to cover them up, and then pretend that our mistakes aren't bad, but in a way, they're to help other people. And we start to harden our hearts in this activity. And so our heart that was so ripe and so a plush for God's spirit to live in and dwell in, it's starting to squeeze him out because it's getting harder and harder with our actions. And so David pours his heart out, and he says... Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain it. I want to challenge you to have this prayer in your life. To actually sit in your own quiet time, however you pray to God, and ask for these things. Every day we should be asking for a new and pure and clean heart. One that is able and willing to sustain the spirit that God wants so desperately to put in you. That we, through the spirit that lives within us, can see this glory and this joy of the salvation that is promised to us. That leads us to making better and more wise decisions of following what God has called us to be. And who he wants us to be as part of his family. And the first step is to say... Obviously, if I'm asking you to create in me this pure heart, I, I obviously have a messed up one that's living in me right now. One that has been full of this world's stuff. I just keep accepting it. The garbage of this world, I decide as I walk along and pass by, I can't leave it there, but I want to pick it up and just put it inside. And then I'm just taking on all of this garbage, and I haven't had an outlet to relieve it to give it up, to give it to somewhere else so I can continue to live better. Later in the same chapter, David tells us this. He's coming before God and he's saying, I want to give you what you really want from me. 
Back in this time, you would go before God, the priest, and you would give a sacrifice. And your sacrifice would basically have your sins forgiven. The aroma of that burnt sacrifice would please the Lord. But throughout Scripture, we start to find out that God doesn't necessarily care about your sacrifice if your heart isn't there behind it. You can go and go through the motions. You can go in and bring what you're supposed to bring and check the boxes off and say, I did everything I was supposed to do. Now I'm forgiven. I can go back and live the exact same way I was living because I'll do this again next month. We can do these things and feel good about ourselves, but that's not what God wants for you. What he wants for you is what David says in, in chapter 51, and verse 16 and 17 of Psalms. He says, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in my burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Why are we afraid of this? Admitting wrong and admitting fault is something we've learned that we can't do because it shows that we're weak or that we're not good enough or whatever it is, and we get defensive instead. And so we start to posture up when people question us on why we did something wrong and we get defensive. And then we start pointing fingers back. Oh, yeah? You're going to call me out on this? Well, what about your life? I've seen what you do. You know how difficult it is to be vulnerable? You know how difficult it is to say, God, I'm bringing you a broken spirit and a broken heart. And the reason my heart is broken is because I know that before you and nobody else are the one that I have sinned against. That the creator of the universe, the one who loves me, the one who crafted me, the one had, who had made me to be good, I chose in your face to do wrong. Do we have a heart within us that's willing to just lay it out there and say, God, I'm broken, but I'm giving this heart to you so that you can help me put it back together? Because only you alone can make this the way it's supposed to be. I've never been really good at uh, trying to keep things away from my parents when I was in trouble. Uh, I tried, and I would build it all up. So in my head, I thought, I got the best plans. And I would start to cover things up, and I'd get it all worked out. And then the moment they'd walk in the door, I was like, oh, fine! And that, here's what happened, and they didn't even ask or care at the time, and they just look at me and go, okay, well, now here's your consequence or whatever. Um, I thought I would be better at that, uh, and then, but I'm not. Uh, there's something about disappointing somebody that you love, and disappointing somebody that trusts your decisions, that you're going to choose to do the right thing, and you don't. There's something about that that breaks you inside. Now, if you allow that break to stay open, if you allow yourself to maintain this brokenness like before, your heart isn't functioning at its optimal level. You don't hear all the things that God is pushing you towards. You don't feel his presence in your life as much as you did before. Instead, you feel brokenness. You feel jaded. You feel bitterness. You feel God's absence. And you start to push the blame. God wants you to come before him and be contrite and say, God, I need your forgiveness in my life. My relationship is nothing unless you are the key to it all. So, we read this for our scripture reading in Joel, chapter 2, 12 through 13. And I, and I love this verse because it gives this idea that, hey, while there is still, still time, make sure you give your heart to God. While there is still time, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, right? We can, we've already had this conversation. I think I've beaten it to death. <laughs> no pun intended. But we are not guaranteed tomorrow. We may not wake up tomorrow. Do not take for granted today. And so, if you have been thinking about these things, listen to this words. That is why the Lord says, turn to me now. Today, the 10th of January. Well, there's still time. Give me your heart. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead and return to the Lord your God. He's merciful, compassionate, slow to get angry, filled with his unfailing love, and eager to relent and not to punish. Don't you want that in your life? You know what beats you up the most when you mess up is this guilt. 
It could be anything. It could be the, the smallest little thing in your life, but you kind of push it away for a little bit. And this guilt is what eats you up because you start to question, like, oh, what's going to happen to me now? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. And guilt does one of two things. It, it, it turns you into, like, this broken, uh, repentant person, or it turns you the other way and says, I need to cover up this stuff. I don't like the way this feels. I need to push back a little bit. I don't want people to see this guilty face that I have. You make excuses. And you make all of these things up of why it, it wasn't your fault. Why what I did was wrong was because of other people. In the beginning, the first time the fall happened, this is exactly what Adam and Eve did. You push the blame. Adam says, it's the woman you made me. And what does Eve say? It's that snake that you made. It's your fault, ultimately, God, for all the things that you did. You see how we push the blame? But if we can come to God and return to the Lord, we can understand how great his mercy is and his love and his compassion. And we can understand that it's not God's ideal, optimal thing to say, I want to punish you. I want to put this finger of punishment on you and make you feel it. No, he wants to show you mercy. Because what he does is he notices that you have a love for him and that you are willing to say, God, I screwed up, but I'm willing. Not because you, I feel like you're making me, but I'm willing to bring all of this before you and say, help me. Help me in all of my transgressions, God. This last point that we can't do unless we have a repentant heart is be allowed to receive a new one. In Ezekiel, during this time, the Israelites were pushed out of, of, of the promised land. They were pushed out of where God wanted them to. And what they started to do was worship other idols and, and, and do all these things that were absent of God. And their hearts were becoming hardened. God wasn't a part of their daily routine anymore. God wasn't a part of their lives anymore. And I bring this up because we can get to this point. You know, even in our best of intentions, we think we have this great relationship with God. David was a man after God's own heart who didn't even realize his sin until Nathan came to him and told him about all of the things that were going on. And David broke down and said, that guy in this story deserves to die or he, re he needs to repay three times what he has taken. And Nathan looks at him and says, that's you, dude. And you know what he said immediately after that is, oh, I deserve death. But God, I pray that you forgive me. And then we get these things, creating me a, a better heart, right? When we start to make a process of choosing against what God wants for us, it doesn't matter how much you know scripture. You can know every scripture in the Bible and can quote it all day long. But if you don't know how to live each of those scriptures that you can quote, what are you doing? What good are you doing? If you don't know how to live the scripture out that God is calling you to, what good is it? We can continue to do whatever we want to do. Now we can use the scripture that we memorized to justify what we do. God wants your heart and he wants it fully and he wants to give you a new one. When you come with this broken heart and you come before him broken and contrite and say, God, fix this. This is what he wants to do for you. When the people return to their homeland, they will remove every trace of their vile images and detestable idols and I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart so that they will obey my decrees and regulations. Then they will truly be my people and I will be their God. But as for those who long for vile images and detestable idols, I will repay them fully for their sins. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. And then later in Ezekiel, this is where we see it. This is where we see the gift. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put in you a new spirit, and I will take your old, stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Other translations will say things like, and I will give you a, a soft heart, one that is capable of housing my spirit. I was talking to my orthopedist the other day because my knee was really swollen out and I thought I really jacked it up again and I wanted to do things that I shouldn't be doing like run or play a soccer game without feeling like I'm 70 years old and have to like put my leg up and 
And, and we were having this back and forth joke because he's had me since my first surgery. And I said, when are you guys going to learn to harvest some cartilage where you can just shoot it into my knee and just immediately fix me? And he goes, hey, we're working on it. But the issue that we have is we can make the cartilage fine. The issue we have is when we put it in there, it has a hard time of connecting, of staying, of being grafted in. God so desperately is so good at making these soft and tender hearts, so good at making them like exactly how he wants them to do. The problem that he has with us is we're not the best host for them. And so he puts it in there, and guess what? Many of us reject it. And it just doesn't work because we're unwilling to change. We're unwilling to sit before him and say, I like this new heart. It beats really good. It's strong. But it calls me to do all these things that make me uncomfortable, like forgive people, show compassion, open doors for people when they're walking behind me, say a nice comment. I just, sometimes I don't want to say nice comments to people. I want to tell it like it is. This heart that God gives me makes me want to do something different. And we can reject it oftentimes. But he so desperately wants to give it to you. He wants to remove that one that you've built up for all of this time of doing all these things that the world puts on you and to transplant it to give you the soft, open, receptive part to hear his word. Part of our challenge for 2016 that we're trying to do, understanding your gifts, understanding what God's called you to do, <clears throat> having a, a heart for God leads you to do and use all of those things so much better. God shapes it and molds it, and he, he gets it where he wants to be. And you know what the other thing our hearts are known for when you use the image of a heart is love. You can have all things, but if you don't have this love, then we aren't doing what God even cares to intend for us to do. And I hope that fully committing our hearts to him is also committing our love and devotion to him and to his people. So each day, like we said, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So I, I pray that, that today in your time that you start asking this God to create in you a clean heart, to renew the spirit within you. So in order for you to remember that, we're going to sing just a verse of that song. And then we... Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, you're an awesome and amazing God. We are grateful to be your children. We are grateful that you love us, that you're compassionate, that you call us towards you, that even in our darkest time that you seek us out because you have called us here for a reason, that we aren't here just to take up space, but we are here because you want us to be more like you. And God, in part of being more like you, we know that we need to come before you. And so I want to pray on behalf of all of us that you forgive us for the things that we struggle with in our lives. That each of us has a different struggle that Satan is putting in our lives to take us away from you. And God, I pray that we can lean on you to push him out of our lives. That we can say, get behind me, Satan. That my eyes can be fixed on your glory and your promise. That I can feel and receive the joy of the salvation that is before me. And that can direct my life in a way that pleases and glorifies you. And God, I pray that with our broken hearts, each day that we bring them before you, that you piece them together more and more so that we can be whole the way that you intended us to be. And God, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.